Lord, thanks for that. Let's just lift our hands to heaven. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for everything you've done. Thank you for every hungry heart. Now, Holy Spirit, just take us in the direction you're blowing in this moment, in this time. So thank you for that. Thank you for the angelic host. Thank you for the revelatory realm that you're opening up to us and up to your people, Lord. Lord, I, I just uh, I thank you that um, you're always with us, guiding us into all truth. So Holy Spirit, guide us into all truth. Lord, I need your help. <laughs> you and I both know I'm no good without you. But you really like showing off through me. So I give you permission to do it however you want, God. Thank you because you've chosen to speak through me today with all my little issues. And Lord, um, fill me with the Holy Spirit. I declare good soil. I declare um, 30, 60, 100 fold return, but I declare good hearers. Lord, I'm asking for the spirit of wisdom on this word. I ask it to... Uh, hit people exactly where they're at in the purposes of God. In Jesus' name, amen. So part of the prophetic lifestyle, and I said this last night, is that words actually cause things to happen. When I was five years old, and I'm just going to tell some stories uh, that are applicable to my own personal journey, uh, I was a very active child. I know you probably find that hard to believe. <laughs> and my mom, who prayed about everything, and she was classic Pentecostal. So she didn't know nice prayers. You know. Lord, take that boy. <laughs> she did it in her Spanish way, though. But I tell you what, the greatest impartation is watching someone who sat before the Lord for hours after working as a teacher. And she would sit there, give me a snack, and I'd hear her interceding. Lord, my kids are yours. Just let them serve you. Talk about seeing. That's a great example. But I was very active, and I was one of those kids who ran through the church. In fact, when they remodeled the sanctuary, they used to have glass doors and made them uh, plastic because they was afraid I was going to bust through those doors one day. And so she brought me to the pastor, and a man not necessarily given to prophecy came up to him. I think I was four years old. And he looks at her, he goes, you don't ever have to worry about this kid. I felt an anointing that I've never felt. This kid will serve me all the days of his life. And she held on to that prophecy when she had experiences that didn't look like that prophecy. <laughs> and so that word created the reality of the realm that I'm living in now. And so uh, when I was between like 9 and 14 years old, uh, uh, I had very vivid dreams. Most of the dreams that I have are very vivid, and I actually live them. I'm thankful for that because, uh, like, I know some people are really fascinated by symbols. Like, I, I don't necessarily enjoy it, to be honest with you. It's like, what does that mean? You know, <laughs> I know you. You gotta like, like, what does that mean? You know, like, what do you think that means? I don't know. You know, <laughs> it means glasses. You know, no, it means more than that. You know, <laughs> but. But I didn't know it at the time, but most of the dreams that I have today, I actually live in those dreams. I do have, um, you know, metaphorical dreams, and, you know, there's always, there's layers to everything, but I dream most of what I'm living now. What is that to me, a helpful indication that I'm on the right place? And I never, uh, like, like I, you know, I don't, my experience is not, when I would watch people minister prophetically, my experience was not, I want to do that. I was like, I I'm good without that. <laughs> and then when you begin, I began to encounter the Lord. And I would get, uh, I remember Michael Solvent was at this outpouring of the Holy Spirit that I was at in the late 90s. And he was one of the Kansas City prophets at the time. And I remember him. I don't remember the message he preached that, that day. But he, um, he, he had everyone stand up, I think close to 600 people. And I'm almost all the way in the back. And he goes all the way to the back. And he just puts his hand on me. He goes, you have a prophetic call. I'm like, great. What does that mean? You know? <laughs> and uh, I remember the man who opened the door for me to begin in full-time ministry. He goes, you're a prophet. 
I go, profit who? <laughs> you mean I need to start a non-profit? <laughs> And so, but all these words call you into your destiny that God says about you. And, I, and here's part of the point of what I'm saying is, uh, usually, I don't, uh, I don't say it couldn't happen, but usually a foundational governmental office of a prophet causes things to happen in people's life. Remember uh, Kingsley Fletcher, uh, I got to spend time with him in, in Durham, uh, probably eight, nine, ten years ago, there was a season where I could spend some time with him. And uh, uh, I remember one time, it was right before I went to Brazil, I think it was 2007, he prayed for me and I knew something had occurred. You see this in Scripture, 1 Samuel 10, verse 6. And I'm cutting to the story because there's some other things I want to share. And the Spirit, this is Samuel prophesying to Saul. The spirit of the Lord will come upon you and you will prophesy with them and you will be turned into another man. And then we skip on to verse 9. You can read the whole thing in 1 Samuel 10. So it was when he had turned back his back from Samuel that God gave him another heart and all those signs came to pass. What happened? When Samuel released the word of the Lord, it caused a change in Saul's life. So part of our prayer is, Father, give us your words, that we may speak your words. And here's uh, something really, uh, thing, and and he talked about valuing what you receive. When we relate to authority properly, that's the authority structure that God puts in us, it is the job of the fivefold ministry, it's a dual job. Uh... It's the job of the leadership of the church because the foundation of the church is the apostolic. Apostolic, part of the grace when operating properly, it's supposed to create a fathering environment where they lift people up and are able to launch them into their destiny. So part of that, so it's supposed to create a family structure, but you're also, as a member of that community, you're supposed to relate to that family structure properly. So when you relate to the, the authority in front of you and the authority of God's rhema word and written word, we receive authority. A lot of people are like, well, I, you know, the Lord is my shepherd. I said, you're a liar. If you can't relate to a human or receive instruction from a, hu- a man or a woman under you, you're probably not r- relating to God's proper authority. It gets quiet. <laughs> Luke nine twenty six. God is equal opportunity, not equal results. For I say unto you that everyone who has will be given more, and from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. So we steward that which we receive to create words that not only create our future, but the future of people around us. All giftings in the proper context function from a foundation of intimacy. All giftings. And let me just uh, also say this. The seeing, the prophetic realm, is not a measure of spiritual maturity. That's why you can see, you can interpret, you can prophesy on the mark, but you can have a character deficit. It is not God's endorsement of your character deficit. He gives a gift freely. He gives it to you as a steward, and he wants your character and your gifting to be on, the, on, 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 on a firm foundation. But you are a steward of that gift. That's why uh, uh, Bill Hammond, I don't know if it's out already, he's got this book, a, a great book for the, a, a season in the body of Christ. How can these things be? And it, how, how can someone move in miracles and they, you know, they're cheating on their wife or they're doing this or they're messing around with this? Well, it's a free gift of grace. It is not a measure of maturity. It's simply a gift. You receive salvation not because you deserve it, not because you've done anything, but because the blood of Jesus is sufficient. You receive favor from heaven, not because of anything you deserve, but everything that he did. And so we live in this tension that we don't live, oh, I'm so lowly. We 
True humility is being able to receive the royalty of the identity that God gave you. But when you receive it in proper context, you go, man, I really need him. So all gifting functions from that place. Jeremiah 28, 3, 18, one of my favorite verses in scripture. For who has stood in the counsel of the Lord and who has perceived his word and who has marked his word and heard it? The counsel of the Lord, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the heavenly place has been open to everyone. What is the truest form of intercession and communion with God? You enter into this dialogue in heaven. You enter in, you're one with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He seats you at this place of authority, and they're in communion with each other, and you get to be right in the middle of it all. And so this lifestyle of communion, and uh, here's some thoughts that are, are really important. Intentionality is an essential element of communion. I often say, I can tell where somebody's heart is by what they spend their time doing and where they spend their money. And here's the, the wonderful part about God. What you hunger for, he desires to give you. One thing have I desired, that will I seek. And here's the interesting thing about God, that God gives a choice and he can't make you do anything, but as soon as you step into the choice that he desires for you, he rewards you for the grace that he's given you to do to make the right choice. But you don't discover it until you make a choice to go in that direction. God is longing to respond to our intentionality. I love Exodus 3. Exodus 3, 3. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. Why does the bush not burn? It's, a, it's, it's an important element that he picked up on this morning. He saw something, and I always wondered, Mo Moses is likely, because he's in a desert, there were, there were fires. There's fires in the desert. So it was not uncommon for him to see what he saw. But there was something particular about this. It was when he turned, God goes, so when the Lord saw, he turned aside to look. And God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. God actually responds to the intentionality of people. And God has promised rewards for those who seek him. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, and you double-minded. Young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. When you come looking for me, you'll find me. But all who search for you will be filled with joy and gladness. May those who love your salvation repeatedly shout, the Lord is great. See, it's impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who comes to him must believe that there is a God and that he rewards, he rewards, he rewards those who diligently seek him. What's the greatest reward? The greatest reward is the unfolding of the beauty of the Son of God. Prophecy, seeing realm, assignments, mantles, business anointing, they are all byproducts of seeing the face of God. Everything in the kingdom is built on the revelation and the fascination of who Jesus is. If it's not focused in that intentional, sensual direction, then any, any realm that you're operating can become distorted. Prosperity is a true part. Prosperity meaning stuff. <laughs> no, it's just spiritual stuff. No, stuff. Like nice stuff. He's got streets of gold. Not efficiency apartments. I'm not mocking that if you live in that. I'm just talking about it actually means stuff, though. Because you have to break that dual mindset. You know, this is spiritual, this is secular. It's stuff. Nice stuff. He's not opposed to nice stuff. At least one amen on that. Amen. It's 
stuff, though, a mark of spirituality. No. If you're challenged financially, it doesn't mean you're lacking faith, but it does mean God is inviting you to step into that realm in the kingdom of God. Glad I got that off my chest. <laughs> so how do we practically draw near to him? What does it look like to draw near to him? My own experience, because I didn't have uh, anyone going, this is, how you, you know, this is how you draw near to God. I was an athlete, and I was a type A personality, and I grew up in a classic Pentecostal home. So when I, when I sat there, I remember sitting in my dorm room, my freshman year in college, I just encountered the Lord the day before, and I go, got the Bible, got you, I'm serving you. Here's the thing, I want to know you, and I want to experience your power. So I'm staying right here in this place, and you and I are getting to know each other. I don't suggest this. This was just my mindset. No, I don't suggest it because there's a lot of striving involved, but it's a different story. I got delivered of that. But after about two minutes, I go, how do people, this is horrible. <laughs> I don't chew. But I began to learn that you have to learn how to quiet yourself before the Lord. So what's a great approach is Jesus said, take my yoke upon you for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So every time, any time I feel, any time I feel worried, confused, concerned about something, I really take that word literally when Jesus said, don't worry. Don't worry. So I go, Lord, I give you this situation give you all the burdens that I'm facing now, and I sit before you. So for me, I had to learn how to develop my inner man. And so uh, one of the great things you'll discover is where you really are in God when you're all by yourself in a room. And... Sometimes the Lord would be like, and, and you know, there's tension to this. I believe in praying in tongues. I believe in worship and stuff. But there's sometimes the Lord just goes, sit there. Don't say anything. <laughs> because you can go to a religious autopilot and go, la, 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 and, and, and when God just wants to sit and you discover the joy of just sitting before him in a posture of rest. So what began to happen is, like, honestly, I would go, all right, 10 minutes. And I would not move for 10 minutes. Now, eventually I began to, you know, my life changed hearing Suzette Hatting. She goes, most of my, because I knew she spent hours with the Lord. So I wanted, I wanted, I'm going for it. And she said, I didn't realize you could mix worship and intercession. I'm not saying mix worship, but I'm saying there's times you just got to learn how to, so I would go, I'm not moving. And then 10 became 15, 30, hour. And I just began to develop myself. And I, it wasn't all quiet, but I asked the Lord to give me the grace to sit before him. I do agree with Leonard Ravenhill. A man is no greater than his inner life. He said prayer life. And so we can approach God and we know that when we approach him, he is there to hear us, and we are before the throne of grace, right there, right now. He was Southerner, right there, right now. <laughs> I love in God that you don't have to wait in line to the throne of grace. And then it went from this intentionality to learning not only to have a a communion time with the Lord, but to learn how to carry the Holy Spirit into every part of my life. But it began with that, those intentional moments with the Lord. And I always encourage people, you need to learn the rhythm and the cadence of the Holy Spirit for your life. 
There's a rhythm. Every morning I get up, there's like a rhythm. I've been on this rhythm where all I can do is talk in tongues. I mean, you know, I, again, there's tension. Honestly, I can't stop talking in tongues. There's a relative or a spirit that I've been walking. And you know, all I got everywhere. And you just want to talk in tongues. And I wanted, I wanted to be quiet on the way here yesterday. He said, no, I need you to worship and pray in tongues. Because he's the leader of the waltz. And there's these ebbs and these flows throughout the day that I try and keep the consciousness of who he is in front of me. And some people like the morning. Some people like the evenings. But you must, the intentionality is such an element of communion with the Lord. And you have to know what the Lord is requiring of you. For some of you, he might require an hour. For others, it's just 30. Whatever it is, though, you have to. There's a meeting, an appointment with the Lord that must become the foundation of your life. Here's another way you can uh, commune with the Lord, worship. Still today, most of my time with the Lord is just, we're, one of my favorite things to do is just worship, not ask for anything. And you know, uh, usually that's when some of the greatest revelation comes. I'm not like looking for a message. He is the message. Another thing is meditate and confess scripture. Sometimes if you've never done that, that'll seem a little weird. But I encourage you, meditate. I add the prophecy. I listen to prophecies over my life, and I add it to what God's called me to do. And I say, this is who I am. This is where I'm going. This is the direction I'm going. Because I add it to the consciousness of who I am before me. Take time to listen. We cover that. Learn to distinguish the sound of his voice. Here's another thing. I encourage people, develop a Bible study reading plan. Most people don't read as much scripture as they think they do. I do believe there's times the Lord can go open to this place in scripture, but usually people do that because they're lazy. <laughs> it gets quiet when you say that. <laughs> like, like Holy Spirit, like just show me where I need to go. Like, <laughs> he can show you a whole year before you need to go there. Now, there, there's, not, there's times, yeah, there's times where the Lord said, move here. And there's scriptures that I'm constantly reading over and over again because they're mine. They're part of my inheritance. But I also have a Bible study reading plan. If I defer from that plan, I just go back to that plan the next day. But I'm constantly reading through scripture. For me personally, my personal thing is part of the reason I read through scripture is because I want an understanding of the scripture from the old and the new constantly before me. I never want to elevate one attribute of the things of God above another. I want to look at it in total context, the whole counsel. And there are seasons where the Lord uh, emphasizes different things in my own life. He's, you know, there's seasons where it's just worship. This, I just said there's seasons of just tongues and, and just tongues and just this relevatory realm and this writing scribe realm and there's but there's also seasons of just rest and you just get the joy of discovering that many of my own seeing experiences just happen as I commune with the Lord here are some barriers to intimacy number one uh, guilt and shame I love this. The Lord will cleanse us through the power of the cross and the blood of Jesus from every guilt and shame. God is present future, but he often has to deal with your past for you to properly enter into your future. It's really important to deal with the issues of the heart when they come to the surface. I don't go around going, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? You know, he's just really good. <laughs> he's just like that. Like, like I know some people, what, whatever. I mean, if that's your thing, like I'm going, you know, I'm going to make hell on the devil. I'm like, I'm not looking for the devil. I have enough challenges without the devil. Most of my challenges are right here in between my mind, you know. <laughs> just keeping Abner straight. I'm not looking for the devil anywhere, you know. I'm hoping to get dangerous enough where the devil does want to have something to do with me. Anyway, that's a different issue. Guilt and shame. 
As a child of God, you never have to live with guilt and shame. Two hurts. Hurts are barriers to intimacy. One of the the number one ways we know is uh, healing of hurts is forgiveness and re-entering into trust and vulnerable relationships. Number three is fears of authority and rejection, intimidating fears. Number four is ignorance. There's no blessing in being ignorant. Ignorance is so powerful that when you believe a lie, it traps you in that ignorance. Belief is so powerful that what you believe, you empower. Self-imposed ceilings and barriers. That's not me. I could never do that. I could never fulfill that. Molds or yokes. One of the absolute keys to life in walking with the transformed mind, seer anointing, is learning to cast down every made imagination that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. The good news is that God has given you the power to overthrow every word, every thought, contrary to the, the works of God in your life. Interesting concept that I've been thinking about. We, it's been said in these sessions that we think from here, the heart. The hidden man of the heart is what the Bible talks about. The eyes of the heart. In the kingdom, we don't think from here, even though God is not opposed to the intellect. Some people need to think. I'm happy that you have a word that you're supposed to marry that man, but he doesn't have a job and he lives with his mom and he's 35. (laughs) So I would like you to use your mind. But the enemy comes to us and he is very strategic. I don't fear the enemy, but I have a healthy fear of what he can do. He understands certain principles that operate in the earth. And so one of the reasons why it's so important that we deal with the issues of the heart is because it says that the enemy will look for an opportune time. And James said that we are drawn away, not by the devil's desire, but by our own desire. And so when we are addressed with, uh, often it will, in my life, it will happen through circumstances. I, I remember, I'm not proud of it. I remember a few years ago, I was flying out of New York. I was headed somewhere. And um, the man at the counter was not really nice to me. So I decided not to be really nice to him. <laughs> and I was right. <laughs> I was wrong. And I'm screaming at him, and he's screaming at me, and I was right. And I walked away, and I go, there's something in my heart that needs to be adjusted. See, when you say, I didn't mean to say that, what you really mean is you didn't mean for people to hear it. (laughs) Why are words so powerful? Because words come from the heart. And what you speak out of your mouth really says what you believe about something. We have to take out when we know it's the right thing to say, but what we say on a daily basis really is what we believe. And so we're presented with situations and uh, we're presented, sometimes we, we lose our temper, I lost my temper or something and I identified something in me that I needed healing from, so I asked the Lord for forgiveness. I talked to a few people close to me. I said, I, I want to confess this area. Confess your faults to one another that you may be healed. There's something about putting it out in the open. You know, you don't, you don't really, you're not really, you're not, you haven't really gone through the full process of forgiveness. If I offend you 
me, not you. You're too nice not to. So I go, ah, you know, I let it out on you. And then, then I, I go, well, I, I probably shouldn't. You know, I'm driving home. The Holy Spirit's like, you shouldn't have done that. It's like, oh, I'm sorry, Lord. But I never come back to the person and go, I'm sorry. You're like, I asked the Lord to forgive me. Well, whoopie doopie doo. <laughs> you hurt somebody else. You cause pain in their life. And you never approach a situation as the victim. Hey, if you hadn't said it to me like that, I wouldn't have said, you just, you just really anger me. No one can control you if you have self-control from the Holy Spirit. Why is this important? Why it must be dealt with in this context? Because if you don't deal with the hurts in your heart, your revelation will go through the filter of unresolved hurts. If you have... If you were with an abusive father, there may be a tendency to you, for you to give corrective words that sound strong and harsh. And so, I encourage people to, part of, I remember the first time I went for a prayer ministry you know, inner healing type of ministry. They're like, oh, have you, have you dealt with this? I was like, and I would look in my journal. I go, yeah, about four years ago. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit told me. I remember when I started out in ministry, uh, I was praying and the Lord spoke to me. My dad has just this amazing story of success in the U.S., left Cuba. Side note, communism doesn't work. <laughs> Neither does socialism. Doesn't make anyone prosperous. God wrote a book called The Bible that endorsed capitalism. Yes, he is. I lost some of you there. <laughs> maybe, not, maybe not how it's expressed in the U.S., but he, he is a free market person. Yeah. That everyone would be free yeah. to create wealth, not for the wealth, the sake of wealth, but, but for the betterment of society. Yeah. Wealth becomes the byproduct of living in a God-given assignment. The most prosperous country in the world ever in world history has been the U.S. built on the free market, built on the idea that men are created in the image of God and should be free to live out their life as God intended. That was actually not a political statement. For some of you, it was. And uh, the Lord spoke to me. He said, stop trying to be a success in ministry so you can prove to your father that you can be a success. Yes, sir. Anything else you'd like to say today? <laughs> so, here's the thing. We're all in process and maybe someone's area is more evident than your area. But we have to give each other the grace to grow. And I don't, I, honestly, I don't, like I've heard some leaders, you just need to come out and tell us. I'm like, what church are you living in? I got a small group of people that I, I find someone that loves you, that knows has your best interests at heart and work through the issues of heart with them. They got quiet there too. I, I just don't believe in spiritual nudativity. <laughs> Find a safe environment where you can deal with the issues of the heart. Some of my most uh, powerful experiences of impartation that opened up the seer realm happened through encounter. Encounter is for the purpose of unveiling the beauty of Jesus that is our divine inheritance also for growing us in authority and maturity and wholeness. As we behold him, we become like the one we're destined to display. Each time we encounter him, we enter into that which God planned before the foundation of the earth, uniquely created and desired for us. All of humanity was created for deep, ongoing encounter of the beauty of God. Encounter also has the ability to unlock that which is resident upon the inside of us. I'll tell this uh, story, two stories here. 
one of the reasons why encounter is so important is because supernatural experiences are essential for us to step into the authority that God has given us in our sphere of influence. Scripturally, you'll find it. Three separate occasions, David is anointed to be king over Israel. I won't go through it just for the sake of time, but I can give it to my notes. Three separate times. And every time, a sphere of authority increased to him every time he was anointed king. So encounters... Part of the reasons God gives us encounters is to release to us an increase of authority. You'll find this in the New Testament church. Peter, uh, he had a really good healing ministry. He was on the cover of Charisma having big healing crusades with Reinhard Bunke. He says to the man as he's walking into the synagogue, silver and gold I have because I haven't heard the Hagen tapes yet. <laughs> But what I have, what did he have? He had a healing gift I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Walk and his feet became steady. They get persecuted. They don't stop what God has called them to do. And they are in a prayer meeting, Acts 4. As they're praying, the Holy Spirit comes on the believers who were there at the day of Pentecost, on those who were added. Peter is in that prayer meeting. Room shakes. Next time you read about healing, Peter's healing ministry, he's not saying anything. All he's doing, his shadow is healing. What happened? My supposition is that he, a greater realm of authority was released to him in that encounter. remember in 2006, I was in uh, Brazil with uh, Randy Clark, and uh, I remember I was in the back of this large meeting, and he's telling the story of how Heidi Baker was touched in Toronto, and he tells a part of the story where she goes, Lord, I, I, I feel like I'm going to die. He goes, good, I want you to die. Mm -hmm. And I remember sitting in the back of the room, See, words and stories create a climate for that to happen in the room. Because words are not just words, they're a creative reality in which grace is released for everyone who hears to enter into that. My words are spirit and life. And she, I remember in the back of the room going, God, I don't, I don't care if anyone likes me. I don't care about anything. I don't care if I lose my reputation. I want everything you have. So he gives this call, and I, you know, I struggle to the front, and first this, this pastor from Maryland prays for me, and boom! And as soon as I go down, it was like I went into an oven, and it hurt really, really bad. Never believe. Don't you see what just, just won't do anything that hurt? No, it felt like I was going to die. <laughs> but I knew it was the Lord, and I said, Lord, more, more. And I felt like I was going to die. I felt like I was convulsing. Probably for 24 hours later, I still felt the fire of God going through my body. And I remember going, more, Lord. And of course, Randy, more, more, more. So for an hour and a half, I'm on the floor. And it's like, really, ah, I felt like, you know, things, I knew things were getting ripped out of me. And, you know, yeah, ah, and it just hurt really bad. And then it switched. And I got drunk, laughing, where they had to carry me to the bus. But as soon as I got up, a whole new realm of seeing had opened to me. I remember as soon as I got up, I remember sitting at lunch, we had these groups, and I would see words over people. And the first meeting I went back to do, a whole nother realm of authority came on me. Last year, I was praying and um, I was really just hungry for more. The thing about God is He meets your hunger, but it stirs more hunger. He answers one question, and then you have eight others. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. And... Um, Lord, if I'd done anything, you know, like, like, we 
give me, I just open up. I want to see you. And Jesus comes to me in vision form, vision in my mind. And um, he comes to me, he says, you are worthy to receive. And he began to anoint my ears, my eyes, my feet. And um, that night, it was like I could see like I've never seen. And I've also seen many times now since that time. I saw it in some small measure, but since that time, I actually see, I know when Jesus is in a meeting. Physically, I mean, I know he's like here, but when I can actually physically see him, what happened? A realm of seeing opened to me and a greater realm of authority. I can discern a lot quicker what God's doing in a room from that day forward. Encounter releases to the authority. Part of the byproduct of encounter is greater authority. One of the things I learned is, uh, remember I was talking to spiritual dad about, um, about this encounter that I had with Jesus. And um, he said, you need to ask the Lord what else he was doing. And I did. And as soon as I did, Jesus came back to me again. And I'm not going to share what he did because it's just personal. But I began to have greater understanding of what he was bringing in that visitation. For whatever reason, once you begin to meditate on the works of the Lord or experiences that you had, it seems like you go back into them. Most people who desire, even if they don't even know in their mind an acknowledgement of it, most, who, I'm saying who are believers, who desire what God has for them, actually live a prophetic lifestyle without even knowing it. And by that I mean, again, it's good scripture, this is the Proverbs 16, we quote, I think 16.3, commit your works to the Lord. When you have a position in your life going, Lord, I want everything you have for me, he has this way of letting you know exactly where you need to be at the right time and the right moment. When your life is positioned in a certain direction, I think it's really hard to miss the purposes of the Lord. You might miss some off-ramps here and there, but you're going to get to where God has for you. When I first began to minister uh, publicly, uh, I didn't see a whole lot. Actually, what's interesting is I, and, and let me just say this, I think that the realm of seeing and prophetic is open to every person, but it might not be a strength of yours. I don't know if that makes sense. What I'm saying is a natural gift was a prophetic gift. Healing was available to me, but it seemed like I had to press into that grace a little more. Healing didn't come as naturally to me. Miracles did not come as naturally to me. And so I, it was available to me, it was for me, but it seemed like I had to press in deeper to that. And that is not the predominant gift in my life. Now, having said that, because I said that, I don't limit myself to one grace or anointing. So there's these tensions in that. But my prophetic gift began to function where I actually was, would give words for churches. I, I remember when I began to minister, I just write. I would write, 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 write. And I couldn't believe how fast these words were coming. It was simply functioning out of uh, what we call the Nabi realm at that time. I, was, I believed that I was probably seeing pictures, but I wasn't used to picking it up on my radar until one day I was at this church and I was ministering over this individual and I see this fireballs going at him. I go, what is that? Well, you know, I'm kind of looking, I'm kind of seeing if everyone else can see it. 
what's the point? Because some of you might not be naturally seers. You might function out of what, what we describe as the Nambi realm, but it doesn't mean that you can't see. It just means it might develop from a different place. My first function prophetically then was what they describe in the Hebrew as the Nabi gift. It's a general word for pro- prophet. It means to bubble, to gush forth, to pour out. It's used 432 times in the Old Testament. It's a clear image of the Spirit's activity. John 7, you know, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. An example of it is Amos chapter 3, verse 8. A lion has roared, who will not fear it? The Lord has spoken, but who can prophesy? The word prophesy there is Nabi. In Joel 2.28, the word when he says your sons and daughters will prophesy, that's Nabi, uh, that's to bubble forth, to gush forth. That's the gift there. And so I, I would see at times, but it operated from just coming out of my mouth first, or writing. One of the things that's interesting is that in the fictional part of the book that I wrote, some of them were real experiences that I would include as part of the fictional, and I would put fictional characters. Others, it was the realm of my imagination, imagining things. That's why I always encourage people, prophetic people are people of vision. Not just vision for the seer realm, but a vision in every area of my life. One of the number one things I dream about, and that's the reason why it's good to dream, because things I would dream about three years ago, I would dream about interacting with angels. I would dream, I, w- I would say, I would, I would have this picture in my mind, oh, I'm going to interact here, I'm going to meet Jesus on this road, and it started to happen. So I encourage people to dream of things in God. But it started out of that, that Nabi realm. And then I remember, I, I'm so thankful uh, for, uh, I remember many years ago, I don't remember what year it was, but I was listening to uh, uh, a CD by Todd Bentley, and he talked about how ministering on the anointing. He said, I would wait upon the Lord, and I would just ask him what he wants to do. And I remember I was in Wisconsin one of the first times I did that, and I got this yellow pad, and the Lord, I said, well, what do you want to do in the meeting? And I actually would have, I didn't have it in complete detail, but the Lord would show me everything he's going to do in the meeting. Now, the first time I stood up to do that, I go, I really hope I heard from you. (laughs) But then I go, on this right section, here's this other person. On this left section's over here. Uh, In the middle is over here. Because I saw it, but how I saw it is I would write it down. And I would sit there with a yellow piece of pad. And apparently, I understand Paul Kane operated out of this realm. They said if he didn't have anything on those index cards, he was done for the meeting. I was not sure, but I decided to risk. So this realm operates out of the realm of risk. And to my amazement, I was seeing correctly. When I talk about seeing, it's, it's what he referred to. I don't have, uh, I've had a few, but I don't have a lot of open, uh, open visions. I think maybe I've had one. I don't remember. I have it maybe written down somewhere. But in the, this is Daniel 7, the first year of Belshazzar, king of ba- Babylon. Daniel had dreams and visions of his head. Of his head. While on his bed. Now here's what happens though as you continually step in to this realm. What took me 30, 40 minutes or would take sometimes an hour just waiting on God in a hotel room, now I'll just stand in a service and go, God, what are you doing? Boom, 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 boom. Why? Because the Holy Spirit are like, it's like working out. The, the, excuse me, the gifts of the Spirit are like muscles. Once you start working those muscles, you begin to develop and go down further, further down that grace. When I began to, I would give words to people and and then the the Lord would stretch me. See, I think prophetic people are all, come in all different shapes and sizes. I have people who I consider amazing prophets and they never give personal words. Now that's between them and the Lord, but I still consider them a prophet. Do I think that they could? Yes, but I think that's between them and the Lord. But I'm saying is, and then I know people who Boom, 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 individual words, boom, boom, boom. And you're like, hey, what's the word of the Lord of the church? 
and they don't know their right from their left. Why? Because they have a strength in another area. I've learned to value it all. I still consider them both prophets, though. But I remember when I would go, go down this line, and I remember one of the first times, I don't know how many years ago it was, the Lord goes, I want you to prophesy over everyone tonight. I go, I don't have a word for everyone. He goes, you will. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? It was Romans, the 12th chapter. Having the gifts according to grace that is given to us, let us prophesy. And if we prophesy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. I remember uh, the Lord said, call that person out. You got a word for him. I said, I don't got nothing. And he goes, no, call him out. I said, hey, yeah, well, you know, person in the blue, I got a word for you. I go, I sure hope I do. <laughs> <laughs> Operating out of uh, just realm of faith. Now, what I've learned to constantly press in, and because I miss something, it doesn't, I, I don't want to turn back in fear and go, oh, that's not going to work for me that way. Never say that the Lord doesn't speak to you that way because he wants to. Now, there may be a predominant thing that he speaks through you with, but never define yourself by that one place because then you, you unknowingly enter into a mindset that God can only speak to me this way. There are some movements that I love to receive from. I think I, I just benefit from the strength that's upon them. But without knowing it, they've set up this hierarchical thing. They believe in prophecy. They just don't want anyone else to do it except the man or woman of God. Joanne, so this is how this functions. I just looked over at her, and as soon as I looked over at her, I saw a picture. There's a picture of uh, Jesus. Sometimes it's an angel, but, so I have to differentiate that. I'm going, is it Jesus or an angel? And Jesus is standing before you in this season, and he's putting his hands on your eyes, and he's unlocking your eyes to see him and give you wisdom through the situation that you're navigating in. And then I saw him pull your hand grab your hand and take you and he's going to take you and he's going to begin to take you on a journey moving with him. So it's an operation of the Nabi flowing out by faith and the seeing realm operating together. Now, here's the thing though. You may flow out of Nabi, you may flow out of a seeing realm, you may flow out of one or the other. I'm just going to say is, I've been in ministry now, I think, full-time ministry, 12 and a half years. I certainly haven't arrived, but I have a history with the Lord of knowing how it operates in me. Why do I say that? Because you go, I could never do that. You don't have to do that. You just have to be who God told you to be and steward, maybe all you see is a picture at this point and, and all you just go, hey, I just see this picture. Does this picture mean anything to you? Because here's the thing. I believe it's the will of God to heal all people. He healed them all at one time. But here's sometimes what happens is sometimes we send people out and they don't heal them all. We tell, we tell only the high points. For every high point great story I can tell you, I can stare a point where there's things I don't understand. Things didn't turn out the way I do. And I just want to say that there's this tension. Are we going for the biblical standard? Yes. But what I want you to do, I want you to, one of the things I want you to leave here is you don't have to go with every, you know, you don't have to have every detail or anything. What is Jesus pleased with? He's pleased with you receiving and stewarding what you have right now. Mike's been experiencing this thing for years. I do believe, though, in settings like this, as we release it, you can step into it far, far quicker than we do. I love laying hands upon people and see them accelerate and do things I never did. But the other side of it, some people are just coming along the pace. And here's the thing. You only have to go on the pace that God has you on. Close with this, and we'll get into some activations.
Now, the other side of that, though, too, is I also feel at times. Sometimes I'll feel the weight of words on me. And if you, if you go somewhere, and the last time God said, I want you to prophesy over everyone, I will feel sometimes, and I have to discern. This is the discerning of spirits. I'll feel a pull on my prophetic gift. And I have to discern, is that Jesus? Or am I supposed to minister prophetically to people? And so... Here's the thing. It's a gift of grace. It's a free gift. I could prophesy probably over every person in this room. I'm not saying that arrogantly. I have a gift from God. And some of you go, that was one of the most amazing words I ever got. And I could have totally missed God. Why? Because it's not what God wanted me to do in that moment. It's really quiet. So you have to discern if people are pulling from the realm of the soul or the spirit. I was like, why, why do I feel that? Why do I feel like this resistance? Because I'm teaching. Well, they want you to prophesy and they want you to minister. They want, they want to feel good when what they really need is an identity shift, not a word shift. I have a word for you. I remember thinking to one lady, you don't need any more words. <laughs> you need to love your spouse, pay your bills on time, <laughs> and be a good employee. <laughs> I see you being a productive citizen in America. <laughs> I see you not blaming everyone for everything else. <laughs> So you want to be healthy believers who are prophetic. We don't want to cause confusion by contradictions in our life. The same power that gives us the ability to see visions and dreams gives us the power to treat people right. Gives us the power to walk in integrity. Gives us the power to answer phone calls. Gives us the power to be prompt people. Gives us the power to be people of our word. You know, honestly, some of the most disappointing things is somebody's just so gifted in an area prophetically, but it's like, like their family can't stand them. That causes confusion. All right, close with these thoughts and we'll do some activations. Here's some concluding thoughts. Ask God for an understanding of his voice. Ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open for everyone who asks, receives. He who seeks, finds. To him who knocks, it will be open. Or what man is among you? If his son asks for bed, will give him a stone. Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more Will your heavenly Father give good things to those who ask? And when we ask for his voice, let's respond to his voice. Let's not wait an extra minute. It's good to maybe wait on something for a few days. Is this you, Lord? Is this, is this what you want? And here's another thing for being a fruitful believer. Learn how to respond to the voice not out of need. God does not respond to need. He responds to faith. If he responded to need, every third world country would be healed. One of the great paradigm shifts we must go un undergo, especially in the Western world, concerning missions in other nations, is not simply to respond to need and become a welfare system for someone else. Your body was created to hear the voice of God. Present your body as a living sacrifice. The lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, if your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. 
Who may ascend to the hill of the Lord? He may stand in his holy place. He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Cleanse your hands and your hearts, James 4, 8. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, to live sensibly, righteously, godly in this present age, looking for blessed hope and appearing of the glory of our great Lord, Savior in Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself a people of his own possession, zealous for good works. Therefore, Romans 6, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey its lust. You don't have to be subject to any evil. You don't have to listen to that voice as go ahead and do that. You have power and authority to say no. And if you can't free yourself on your own, go find somebody who loves you, has compassion for you, won't think you're ugly and, or you know, wrong with you and just go, in the name of Jesus, we say that this issue is done. We break all agreements with this work of darkness. Here's some characteristics of prophetic people. I am closing. Presence people. Two, responsible people. Three, people under authority. Four, people who understand mercy and judgment. Obedient people, humble people, uh, vision people, learning and listening people. Here's another really, really important, and I'll close with this. People who know how to communicate. It's not enough to have a revelation it's enough to know what to do with the revelation. There's seers in here. You came because to see a conference. So if you see something or you're working with your pastor, your leader, or, or a ministry that you're working with, you know, and you go, I see a cloud. Great. <laughs> the guy's a teacher. You know, maybe it doesn't even function like that. Like, Give them something to use with that. Did you get something out of this? Yeah. I want to say, if I, if I do forget to say, I'm very thankful that you came this day and a half. I know some of you sacrificed a lot. You're from Florida, aren't you? Who else is from? Where in Florida? You're from outside Orlando. What's the name of the town again? Oh, thank you so much for blessing us. All the way from Florida. When are you going home? Wow. Uh, at night. Florida? Anyone else from out of state? You're from out of state? Massachusetts in the back? Where? Virginia? Martinsville, Virginia. In the back, where are you from? Oh, that's right, my Delaware crew. <laughs> Delaware. Seven hours to get here, huh? Thank you for honoring us with your presence. Anyone else from more than two hours away? The Rock, Roxford? Oxford. Where else? I saw some other hand. In the back there? Where's that? Wow, cool. How did you hear about this conference? Oh, awesome. Thank you for coming. Anyone else from a little further away? High Point. That's like another country. <laughs> well, like four hours, right? Four hours to High Point. Where in Southern Virginia? Suffolk. How many hours did it, by car? Wow. How far is Fayetteville from Fayetteville? <laughs> Two hours. Awesome. We'll just stand. I just want to release some things and we're going to get some activations. Do you receive this word? Yes. Just lift your hands to heaven. I bless you today with the righteousness of your Father in heaven. I say that you're holy, clean, and without blemish before him. I say that the spirit of truth resides on you to bring you into all truth. 
I say that every lie that the enemy has tried to get you to believe would be exposed in this coming season. Any agreements, alignments, mindsets, yokes, I break the power over those over your life. And by the authority God has given me in the body of Christ, I say that this is a season of divine alignment in your life. I say that your Father in heaven takes great pleasure over your life and he rejoiced the day you were born. I say that you are a, new, a unique chosen to be a new, unique expression of the Lord Jesus Christ in the earth. I say that you're dearly loved because you're part of the body of Christ. I say that the unique part that you play in the purposes of, of God would come forth. I say from this day forward, there'll be weight and authority upon the words that you speak. There'll be words of fire and authority. I break you free from uh, things that have held you back. And I declare a grace over your life to press on to the mark of the high calling. I declare Philippians 3 would be stamped upon your life from this day forward. I declare family reconciliation for some of you. Healing in your family. I declare for as for you and your house, they will serve the Lord. I say that things that belong to you, uh, wills and inheritance and money that belongs to you would come to you in the name of Jesus. I declare Deuteronomy uh, 8.18, that is the Lord your God who gives you the power to get wealth. So I bless you with creative ideas. I bless you with ideas that would bring you prosperity and would turn people's hearts to God. I bless your hands to be the hands of Jesus. I say that your hands are holy and sanctified and set apart for pure purposes of God. I say that everything you touch would, would, be, would be touched with the glory of God. I bless you with John 17, 3, that this would be eternal life, that you would know God and the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I bless you to dialogue with the Father, the Son, and the wonderful Holy Spirit. I say that he leads you and to guide you into all truth. I say that there's a revelation of the word coming to you that you've never known. I say particularly for some of you, the gospels will open to you. The Gospel of John, the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of Matthew. I just declare that they're opening to you in a way you've never known. And I declare that you're able to display the multi-dimensional, multi-faceted of God. I say that the favor of God is on you. The favor of God surrounds you. The favor of God goes before you in everything you do. I bless you with apostolic strength to fulfill everything God's called you to do. And Lord, by the authority you've given me, as this church has opened its doors to my ministry, I release a blessing over this house to shake this region for the purposes of God, to upplant every work of darkness and in its place plant the kingdom of heaven.